Every year, hundreds of people are reported missing in national parks and forests, many of them children, and most are eventually found whether dead or alive. But a small percentage of the cases, some right here in Oregon, are never solved. The mystery those cases present has one man wondering if there's a common denominator behind the disappearances that have search and rescue crews continuing to scratch their heads. We turned around and here was this little toddler walking out of the fog with absolutely no clothes on at all. Well, it's, it's troubling. Every month in almost every state, people go into the wilderness and don't come out. Stories like that are what fuel David Politis. Forever rifling newspaper archives and badgering federal agencies for public records, he's discovered more than 400 cases of people who wandered into the wilderness but never came back. Now, there are so many missing kids in Oregon, it's ridiculous. Accounts of children, people vanishing, seemingly swallowed up by the many endless forests across America or even later found in ways that defy logic. These were unusual things that don't make sense that happened to cluster together, cluster together in three to four, sometimes as many as 20, 30 people missing at one location. He's mapped out what appear to be more than 30 clusters of vanishings in forests and national parks coast to coast. Some of those clusters and cases right here in Oregon, all of them documented and described in his two books. According to Oregon State Police, there are 41 missing children in Oregon. And now also in the movie Missing 411, releasing in a couple of months. In a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times. And then the child is found there maybe a year, maybe a few years later. The search coordinators themselves are baffled by it too the ones they don't think is criminal in nature. Once a cop, Politis got hooked on the inexplicable, intriguing and mysterious missing persons cases only after a government employee knocked on the door of his hotel near Park Service Land and confided in him, sharing stories about people disappearing at national parks like Crater Lake and Yosemite. The ranger described to me if you were standing straight up and you just had your shirt or just had your pants on and you melted directly into your pants, that's what it looked like to him. The pants were laying on the ground in a very neat pile. Just one of many accounts in his books that leave search crews wondering if they'll ever find closure. And after seven years of research, we found that they replicate themselves in these geographical clusters around the US. One of those clusters being Crater Lake. 10 years ago, COIN6 covered the search and rescue effort for eight-year-old Samuel Belke, who had a mild form of autism and feared loud noises and bright lights. So when Sammy darted away from his father near Cleetwood Cove at Crater Lake, the many searchers could not use the customary air horns and whistles to try and find him. Well, Sammy's family uh, has let us know that one of the things he likes to do is to curl up in small spaces. Any of these uh, spaces where you could uh, fit a small person are places that we'd want to be searching. When him and his dad went up to Crater Lake and uh, they were on a little vacation, the circumstances behind his disappearance and the subsequent inability of the Park Service to find him is unusual. And they brought in canines. Canines couldn't pick up a scent. They brought in air support. They couldn't find him. Uh, a multi, multi-day search couldn't locate the boy. Eight years earlier, another eight-year-old boy, Derek Engebretson, vanished from this spot, a densely wooded mountainside above Upper Klamath Lake, not far from Crater Lake National Park. Now we got a dog up here, I guess. We took some, some of my brother's clothes, and we got a dog up here that's going to try to sniff him out or something. Search and rescue crews spent more than 10,000 hours looking for Derek, but still haven't found a single clue. When Derek was out there with his dad and his grandpa, they, somehow or another, he just walked around, didn't go far, there was snow on the ground, they should have been able to track him, and he vanishes. That's another case that you search an area, uh, you have good information, 
you, you go right to where they were and they're just not there. I mean, after all this time, they still do a yearly search for that. They, uh, the search team goes out and does a training and they'll go back and search that area every year. Scott Lucas is the search and rescue coordinator at Oregon's Office of Emergency Management. He says it's only one or two percent of the missions they launch that don't return answers, but they average about 900 searches a year. Multnomah County coordinator, you know, he, he told me personally a couple months ago he's baffled by the ones he can't find. He just, you know, where do they go, where do they disappear to, or they just don't want to be found. So, and, and that comes into play too. And yet, Oregon does have its share of miraculous and mystifying survival stories also. Just kind of got tunnel vision, you know, and just kept focusing in on walking down this one road. I really had no idea where I was going. Cody Sheehy was just six years old when he wandered off deep into the Wallawa wilderness. Search crews and two helicopters with FLIR technology couldn't find a trace of him in the rugged woods, dampened by a cold mixed snow and rainfall. In almost all these cases, they bring in helicopters with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, to look for heat signatures on the ground. They can't find a heat signature. That's unusual. But the next morning, 15 hours later and 20 miles away, Cody walked up to a house and asked for help. I was physically at the end of my rope that next morning. And if I hadn't been in a situation where people found me at that time, um, I don't know how I would have done for another night out there. I could easily have died. More than 30 years before Cody's harrowing experience, another astonishing story unfolded near Pendleton, where two and a half year old Keith Parkins ran and stumbled over a dozen miles of snow covered timberland and mountains before he was found 19 hours later, stiff and cold, but alive. I mean, to me, being a parent, I can't see my two year old climbing over two mountain ranges in the dark. That, that's pretty hard to believe. And there's some cases where little kids are alleged to have walked up to 20 miles overnight or climbed phenomenal heights, three and 4,000 feet. And those are facts and it's highly, highly hard to believe. Yeah, I'm not not as uh, overly mystical person. Um, I don't think I didn't encounter anything to my memory that was unusual other than the fact that that situation was extremely unusual. Sheehy is alive, but the fate of others like Derek Ingebretson and Sammy Belke are why Politis keeps digging for answers. In Belke's case, we interviewed one of the local sheriffs that was involved two days after he disappeared about this incident. And I won't say what he said, but it's in the movie. It's, it's pretty stunning. At this point, Politis doesn't offer any of his own theories for what happened. He does tell me his books just report the facts of the missing persons cases and that he doesn't believe in the paranormal per se.